Okay, we are already late. I apologize uh, for it. There was a fire in the cafe or something like <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I apologize. Um, so our, our sixth uh, panel, we have um, with us, um, and now I, I, I hope I will not be phonetically too uh, uh, experimental. It's Ovidiu uh, Tihin Deleano. Is it? Wow, yeah. Gaspar Miklos Tamas told me that this is the way to pronounce your name. And uh, Madeleine Nikolova. Um, so as you will um, have seen from the uh, abstracts, we are now dealing with, um, with uh, the Romanian and Bulgarian situations. Um, and um, of course the question is, I mean, we all know that there is a, a certain um, institutional framework which uh, pushes us um, to a certain extent towards including, um, to broadening the concept of the region. This is the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, of course, uh, the Belgrade office being responsible for uh, not only for former Yugoslavia, but also Bulgaria and Romania. But this, of course, is not um, neither the sole reason nor a sufficient reason to, to include um, uh, uh, the ex-Yugoslav space uh, with the um, Bulgarian or uh, Romanian um, experience in, in, into one uh, concept, be, uh, even if it is as diffuse uh, and as undetermined as the region. So what would be what would be the initial, uh, I would say, what would be the basic legitimation? Well, um, if you look at the historical trajectories of, of, of the Yugoslav, um, uh, the former, of former Yugoslavia, and compare this, of course, with uh, Bulgaria and Romania, uh, well, um, we see that, um, at least historically, uh, since after the Second World War, until the coming down of, of the Berlin Wall, this, um, uh, one could hardly speak um, about a, a common experience. The Yugoslav, uh, um, the Yugoslav case was uh, a, a very uh, specific one, while, um, well, of course, Bulgaria and Romania and Moldavia uh, have, uh, have been integrated into, well, the Soviet bloc. And, um, but the irony is, of course, of course both have, have their own uh, version of the socialist uh, 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 project or experiment, but uh, the irony may be that um, it is uh, precisely now, that is after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, that, um, that we can really uh, start to uh, discuss things in, in terms of a region uh, more than just um, arbitrary geographical uh, description, but uh, a common experience uh, uh, with, with, very, uh, uh, with a, a very similar structural um, 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 structural outlines, both in the economy, the, uh, the, the political orientation towards the West, and so on and so on. So, um, and based on that, maybe it is also time to not only acknowledge this analytically, but also to try to, to um, develop it, uh, to see it as a chance to, to, to really develop, uh, to develop um, something which, out of which maybe there could at one point, um, out of, you know, this, this um, and the start of co communication within the region, and based on this common uh, experience, the left could also maybe um, be one of the facilitators of forming something that is uh, maybe within the constellation of, of the European Union, um, a new block, uh, a potential block. And the left, I believe, is, um, has the responsibility at least to consider that option. So that would be my, my introduction. And now um, uh, um, we haven't discussed uh, the succession, who, who wants to go first? He will go because he has the PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, he has the PowerPoint. The good, a very good argument. Okay, since you have the PowerPoint. How do I do with the... Well, then we change. Ah, okay, all right. So, I'll give you. And I believe we will return to that in the discussion. But before that, um, Madeleine, please. Okay. So maybe I should first say something about the collectives that I'm part mm -hmm. of. Um, one is uh, the collective of social center, uh, HASPEL, it, it is called HASPEL, and we founded it in 2010 with uh, a lot of people that were active in different types of movements before anarchists, environmentalists, and so on. Yeah, but in 2012, we joined forces with an artistic group, experimental artistic group uh, that consists of uh, people dealing with sculpture and theater. And so we moved to a bigger place then, and then we started this initiative called New Left Perspectives. And with it, we tried to build a, a counter-hegemonic anti-capitalist stance uh, for opening um, a space for more critical thought that is more accessible to the wider public. 
So I start with uh, my presentation. Yeah. Um, I'd like to st start with a short disclaimer. First of all, it is fundamental to understand that the, the left was never a unified force, and there had been strong tensions between various strands, movements, groups, etc., also within the time frame of state socialism itself. From the initial multi-party uh, people's democracy that started in Bulgaria in 44 and ended with the execution of the main leader of the left opposition from the Agrarian Socialist Party in 1948. In the following period, the Stalinists took over and suppressed severely any left opposition. The Agrarians, who were unwilling to cooperate, the pro-Tito communists and the anarchists, in, the, in 1956, BCP took a strong pro Khrushchev stand and the leadership of the party changed dramatically. The process of destalinization led to many reforms and liberalizations. For instance, prisons, prison camps were closed in early 60s, many political prisoners rehabilitated and so on. Another major development of the 60s was the initiation of liberal economic reforms, albeit not comparable to the Yugoslavian model, but there were some pro-market concessions. The latter was seen by many as too big of compromise, triggering Stalinist and Maoist resistances, arguably the strongest opposition to, Ziv to Zivkov's rule. Another important shift after the 60s is that there was a strong revival of nationalism. The 1970s and 80s saw the rise of a small intellectual dissident movement. Parts of it, inspired by Marxist humanism, were formative of of a whole generation of left intellectuals that continued to be somewhat influential after 89. Zivkov himself remained ambivalent about the perestroika and Gorbachev didn't believe in his ability to carry it out in Bulgaria. In fact, after the global capitalist crisis of the early 1970s, Bulgaria was getting heavily indebted and partial measures for e economic liberalization were pushed forward by Western international financial institutions, a phenomenon that remains vastly understudied. These reforms slowly entrenched the industrial nomenclature, a class of red managers that managed to push further the economic liberalization up to an internal coup d'etat in the party in 89 and full-blown restoration of capitalism. Zivkov made some concessions, but this transformation happened just to ensure Zivkov stays in power despite him acknowledging that, I quote, we lost the race with capitalism. At the end of 89, with the help of the Soviets, a group of the discontent with Zivkov's rule was formed. Lukanov, Modenov and Livov were part of this group. In early 1990s, Lukanov's government was pushing strongly for shock therapy with the help of the IMF and the World Bank. Liu, on the other hand, was rather on the left of the party, aiming for what they called at the time a transition to democratic socialism. I cannot go in into detail here, what, but what I'm trying to do is to outline a peculiar background against which we need to think the changes after 89. First of all, it is not a radical break, but it is not in the sense that the communists are currently dominating political discourse also. Instead, I mean that there had been many transformation of socialism itself and also of the left. Another key development of late, late socialism was the rise of nationalism that started with the 60s liberalization and culminated in the expulsion of more than 360,000 Bulgarian Turks in 89 and the forceful renaming of all the Muslims. After the coup d'etat in 89, BCP decided to give the right of the Muslims to have their original names back. This triggered a strong, a strong resistance from members of the Communist Party, feeling their nationalist sentiments were betrayed. They have organized into a strong nationalist movement called Tokazunai, staging protests and violent attacks against both minorities and governmental institutions. They came to unite the nationalist splinters from the Communist Party that had decided to engineer a transition to pro-Western liberal democracy. Subsequently, BSP managed to reintegrate the disillusioned nationalists who were basically trying to instigate a civil war by proposing them key positions within the party. For example, Georgi Parvanov started his political career as a far-right activist from Okazanai, but when BSP integrated them, he managed to grow to the highest ranks of the party and was elected as president of Bulgaria twice on their mandate. In other words, the price of seizing the far-right provocations by Okazanai was their integration into the mainstream of BSP. The BSP tried to tame its left 
wing anti-war opposition too. Some 30,000 people protested in Sofia in 99 against the bombings in Yugoslavia, while many of the BSP leaders campaigned against Bulgaria allowing airspace to NATO, as did Georgi Pervanov. But as soon as in 2001 he was elected president, he gave up on his anti-militarism, signed for American military bases in Bulgaria and supported the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. In this manner, BSP opened up for critique from the left. This type of critique is often a mix between left anti-imperialist positions and nationalist and even racist trends and is embodied, for example, in a party called New Dawn. This party became instrumental to the creation of the new fascist party, Attacka. After wars, the new dawn entered into a coalition with BSP again. Even worse is the case with the Bulgarian anti-fascist union, the political organization of the old partisans that is traditionally aligned with the BSP, but in 2005 their leadership had supported the creation of the new fascist party attack as well. Even now, the BSP and the Movement for Rights and Liberties are in an informal coalition with Attaka, which was also an informal partner of the right-wing authoritari authoritarian party GERP in the previous government. The social democratic stance in BSP has now become totally neoliberal. BSP introduced the flat tax during their 2005-2009 term in power and forced radical budget cuts in the sphere of education. This nationalist left line, though, remain present in various left-wing groups, intellectuals, journalists, and so on. Such an example is the party of Chakarov, called Union of the Communists in Bulgaria, and their leader worked as a political advisor of Zhivkov in the 80s and was, and still is, strongly supportive of the repression against the Bulgarian Turks. As already mentioned, the Bulgarian Communist Party, pushed externally by the international financial institutions and internally by the Red Managers, had been shifting slowly to the right since the 70s. 89 marked the final victory of the forces that aim, aimed at full capitalist restoration. But nevertheless, there was a, still a strong left opposition within the party that saw 89 as a possibility for what they called at the time transition to democratic socialism. The compromises that were achieved in the party in the early 90s were around the idea that it is possible to make some kind of a more humane and uh, they called it gradualist transition to capitalism or to neoliberalism. The anti-communists in the early 90s were able to initiate a radical liberalization in the agricultural sector that included the destruction of the old cooperative forms, a process that remained in the social memory as the liquidation. The rapid rural underdevelopment and impoverishment that followed unleashed strong discontent and saw a rise of the support for BSP. They won the election in 94 on a mandate to tame the liberal agricultural reform. More generally, BSP promised alternative transition. BSP tried to negotiate, though unsuccessfully, alternative sources of financial aid, namely with China, in order to cope with the growing debt crisis, but at the same time they have furthered the liberalization of the national private banking sector with public money. Their hope was that the newly formed private banks would facilitate the constitution of a national capitalist clutch, a class. Huge credits were given, but the banking sector did not hold and this led to hyperinflation and subsequent banking crisis. Those who were able to take out huge loans denominated in the Bulgarian currency were the big winners and those who came to be known as credit millionaires. Oftentimes they were close to BSP. What this was is basically primitive accumulation via huge dispossession of public money. The crisis grew up to the winter of 96-97 when a huge popular mobilization led by, by the anti-communists but also by the trade unions toppled the government. In 97, the anti-communist UDF came to power and applied extreme austerity measures, a currency board, mass privatization, dismantling of the welfare state, and so on. What is important here is that BSP's promise for alternative transition was a result of a strong left resistance led by the agricultural cooperatives, whose political voice was the newspaper Zemia or Land, which up to the early 2000s was one of the top selling newspapers. They indeed was, were successful in protecting some of the cooperative structures that still exist to this day, even though it is hard for them to exist in the struggle with larger private businesses. Zemia tried to oppose not only privatization, but Bulgaria's support of US imperialism. 
Nevertheless, that rural left resistance slowly died out, along with the growth of a class of big rural private <coughs> farmers who were continuously supported both by EU funds and national policies after 97. Another left opposition emerging out of the discontent from the BSP's right turn came from party activists based in Sofia and other big cities who engaged in two strategies. On the one hand, this was to form a coherent internal, internal opposition. This solidified when in 2007 BSP supported 10% flat income tax. The left in the Socialist Party, organized around Liwov, formed the left wing of the Bulgarian Social Socialist Party, an NGO that comprised by uh, disillusioned party activists, usually of the older generations. It managed to attract strong media attention and many people still support BSP solely because they believed the left wing might exert some influence on the party. Uh, its leader is Stuyov, uh, and he was instrumental in writing BSP's economic program before the last elections that included the removal of uh, what they introduced, the flat tax, and other minor socialist reforms. But immediately after BSP was able to form the current ruling coalition, they have stated uh, that they are abandoning their economic promises. Um, This initiative, though, is virtually only a media phenomenon, and this is also clear by the utter cynicism in the way Swiof responded to the current protest wave, sta stating that if the cover current government falls, a greedier oligarchy than ours will take power. On the other hand, there was strategy to form political parties and movements from the Socialist Party. The most successful example of that was the Bulgarian left. It is the only such attempt that aimed to articulate its goals and projects, not only via nostalgic claims towards the past, but via rethinking of a socialist future in the language of the wider European radical left. Bulgarian left aimed to cut with the conservative life line in the other left formation that stemmed out of BSP. The difficulties they are facing are related to the engagement with concrete political struggles, movements and initiatives, as well as to the incapacity to produce more efficient symbolic capital and to their general incapacity to attract members beyond the ex-members of BSP. And this led to terrible results in the last elections, less than a quarter of percent. Still, this is not to blame these fa failures on the party itself. Those difficulties are objective and connected with the wider crisis, not only of the socialist language itself, but of <coughs> political representation as such. The February protest mobilizations uh, in Bulgaria were rather framed against political representation, against parties, against the left-right political distinction, and even against politics itself. Despite all difficulties it faces, the Bulgarian left remains the only socialist political party that is able to formulate somewhat more articulate vision of the future beyond socialist nostalgia or nationalism. In the beginning of the 2000s, new groups inspired by the anti-globalization movement were formed. Most of them were anarchists or environmentalists, but there are some communist groups as well. Bulgarian environmentalism grew out of left dissident oppositions in the late 80s, but in the course of the 90s it became more liberal and mainstream. Nevertheless, some environmentalist groups sustained their left critique and in the end of the 90s were campaigning against, against the IMF. In early 2000, it, uh, 2000s, it was precisely some of the environmentalist groups and activists inspired by the global so-called anti-globalization movement that started to form small grassroots anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist campaigns together with young anarchists. The main, the main environmentalist current, though, especially the NGOs, adopted new liberal technocratic pro-EU language. This became particularly clear with the formations uh, of the environmentalist party called the Greens after 2007. They openly supported flat tax, Bologna educational reforms, and liberalization of healthcare. It didn't happen without an internal fight, but currently the Greens are in negotiation with the parties that, that remained out of the dissolution of the UDF in early 2000s to form a new right-wing party called Reform Bloc. These right-wing parties are openly calling for fracking, cyanide, gold mining, nuclear energy, and GMOs. The campaigns against these 
uh, free are the most popular environmentalist campaigns in Bulgaria. Does the Greens risk losing their identity, refusing to call themselves themselves left or right, and showing that they too are part of this post-ideological shift? Still, many of the activists are engaged in progressive campaigns uh, um, for agricultural reforms, uh, supporting the growing food cooperative movement and others. Politically, the left of the early environmentalist movement got marginalized and their party, called the Green Party, is virtually non-existent. Non in Sofia, there are some pro-Stalinist youth activists that are active in various campaigns. They've also constituted themselves with the emergence of grassroots left activism in the early 2000s, particularly with the anti-imperialist mobilizations of the time. They managed to interact with different organizations campaigning for free education and anti-racism. They're certainly not nationalist or racist, but their Stalinist identity and somewhat problematic and simplistic political positions for instance, refusing to make a difference between Israel, Zionism, and fascism, praise of North Korea, and others. Nevertheless, they attracted various problematic and unstable activists, some of whom found it easy to shift towards openly Nazi groups. On the other hand, they, uh, he, um, in the anarchist groups, there is the Restored Organization Federation of the Anarchists in Bulgaria, comprising of elder activists repressed during state socialism, and also some activists from before World War II. Also, some younger people joined in the early 90s. After 2001, a youth wing of FAP of the Federation was created, inspired again by Genoa and other big anti-globalization mobilizations. This faction was called anarcho-resistance and worked closely with the environmentalist movement and took active part in the campaigns against the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. In the last years, many of the younger anarchists abandoned their anarchist or basically subcultural identity and fetishizations of symbols, mostly due to their marginalization, but along with that also their left-wing political identity in a very radical manner, proclaiming that they're beyond ideologies in the name of direct democracy, supposedly a post-ideological position, they threw themselves into pragmatic activism oriented mainly towards action without reflection. This trend became very effective, effective and grew vastly in view of this year's protests because it fits very well in the wider anti-party system and anti-intellectual spirit. It led to the formation of many new grassroots groups inspired also by protest movements similar to Occupy. The anarchists who insisted on their tradition and uh, on their subcultural emblem further marginalized themselves. Some of them tried to form interesting political initiatives, such as the Autonomous Workers' Union, union but they failed to attract any members. I could speak more about some uh, of the strikes orga organized by the confederations of the trade unions, but I guess I don't have that much time. It depends whether you want. You have up to half an hour if you want it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that would mean 10 more minutes even. Okay, so maybe someone could maybe ask so. a question about the no. trade unions. <laughs> okay. Um, a new strand of left politics is emerging in the last years, called a new left, not in the sense of emulation of the US or Western 60s, but as peculiar in the current Bulgarian context, that is to say a left opposition that is critical of liberalism as much as it is to a right turn of socialist party. Its critique of the Socialist Party, unlike that of the right and the liberal one, is distinctly progressive, in the sense that what is attacked is its racism, misogyny, and so on, but also its new liberal economic policies, the introduction of the flat tax, and their active part in the destruction of the welfare. Our critique of capitalism is not based upon a utopia modeled by the past, but tries to think of radical critiques of the present based upon an idea of the future. In other words, it is critical of socialist nostalgia and the ways in which nostalgia has been instrumental to the current regime. Firstly, by depoliticization and decontextualization of past aesthetics, enabling them to be used for opening new markets. They actually sell pasta with socialist symbols. Mm -hmm and thus furthering capital accumulation. Secondly, by confusing the social achievements of so state socialism with its authoritarian and racist policies. Thirdly, by discrediting left critique and legitimating the worst right-wing right reforms. In the last couple of years, the notion of the new left was not only used by our political organizations, organization, but also 
uh, by journalists, intellectual and activists. Our group might have been the first to self-identify with a category, but it is really a concept which does not have a strict meaning and it is being struggled over by fa various forces. For example, another important political organization that we are, we, are, we're, we are working with to call itself a new left is Solidarna Bulgaria, uh, Bulgaria or Solidarity Bulgaria. Its politics are left to social democracy and it comprises of social democrats, democrats mostly. Recently, some major political figures from BSP had, uh, had also tried to use the concept, probi probing the possibility to form another splinter party from BSP. Unfortunately, with politics that are not so clear. What I'm trying to say is that in the past couple of years, more, most certainly, a new specter is haunting Bulgaria, and this is the specter of the Bulgarian new left. It is rather what is projected into it and not some kind of, co of a consistent whole. This situation creates as many opportunities as there are hidden danger dangers. For instance, during this year's protest mobilizations, there were many voices asking what is the Bulgarian new left position here. This opens up potentials for intervention, a space for a more radical critique, but it also enables the possibility of liberals and social democrats to see yet another way to legitimate li liberal democracy, seeing in the new left another ally in the crusade for human rights, more transparency, fight against corruption and so-called populism. The proper tactical question is how the new left can avoid those problems without marginalizing itself via going back either in the subcultural or by limiting itself to purely cultural and intellectual critique. How is it possible not to reduce the new left to some kind of a rainbow coalition based on an idea of abstract solidarity between a plurality of struggles for recognition? LGBT rights, women rights, minority rights, and anti-capitalism only here in a long chain of equivalences based on a signifier such as direct democracy. Can the new left avoid its integration within the liberal status quo? That is to say, how is it possible to rebuild such a chain of equivalences based on concrete solidarities in the opposition to capital, enabling the space for viable socialist alternatives? These questions are key, but it is also key to have in mind that the new left is rather a specter and not a well-organized and strong political material force, comprising of scattered initiatives and individuals. Our strategy has been up to now to open a space to stimulate the collective imaginaries of the possibilities of the new left. To think that it is possible to put together well-articulated and coherent policy proposals at this stage would be a naive and utter voluntarism, revealing an incapacity to understand the constellation of the concrete social forces. Therefore, it is bound to fail. In other words, such a strategy would not lead to anything as simply no one would follow it. What is possible, nevertheless, apart from purely conceptual work, mobilizing students and opening a public debate, constructing an intellectually coherent criti critique of the mainstream ideological hegemony, is to engage in hegemonization of strategically key political struggles that hold the potential of their expansion. For instance, some of the new left activists have engaged with conservative and sometimes nationalist initiatives against foreign investment in the agricultural industry. But here it is once again easy to break the xenophobic rationalities, not by abstract slogans, but by juxtaposing all, the, all their concerns to concrete material experiences and struggles. Part uh, practically exposing the inconsistencies of the conservative positions, namely in showing the impossibility to distinguish between national and foreign agricultural investors on the ground. They are engaged in virtually the same agricultural methods, have the identical anti-labor policies, they are integrated in virtually the same international markets, and so on. Precisely on that ground, it is possible to rethink, practically, the very role of large private agricultural production, as opposed to small-scale or cooperative production. Similar are our activities against water privatization, and uh, the privatization of uh, sanitation services, that is usually the topic of the far right and that is at the same time extremely racist against the Roma minorities. Here, nevertheless, it is possible to undermine the racist logic of the far right, trying to facilitate the constitution of a chain of equivalence based on the opposition to capital that puts both conservative anti-privatization activists and Roma activists on the same side, grounding anti-racism not on abstract humanitarianism, but on concrete material interests. 
Both examples show the potential of a critique of both hegemonic discourses, namely liberalism and nationalism, not solely intellectually, but also practically, intervening in concrete political situations and rendering them both unsustainable. In other words, such an intervention would be an attempt to recombine the chains of equivalence of concrete political mobilizations, trying to facilitate their re-articulation around socialist populist signifiers in opposition to capital accumulation, dispossession, and reproduction. Nevertheless, the conditions of possibility of such a stance are not abstracted from the theoretical work. In both of the cases that were mentioned, those conditions came out of well-timed intellectual endeavor, publications, research, etc., as well as from stepping onto the spectral new left thus pointing towards the tactical potentials of a well-timed theoretical practice in the process of rethinking socialist politics today. I'd like to end on a more general note on the goals of the new left and its capacity to radicalize itself in its engagement with concrete and common struggles. As Jody Dean puts it, the people are the exploited in conflict with the exploiters, the, opp the oppressed against the oppressors. The exploiters, though they might seem foreign, uncover the impossibility of the totalization <coughs> of the political. The communist subject, as opposed to the liberal nationalist one, refuses to transform the structure of void at the heart of the community into a loss. This subject claims its preparedness to articulate new institutions and to acknowledge social antagonisms without making them seem natural. The subjectivation of the people that manages to go beyond this search of a totality requires a radical break with the empty liberal nationalist shell, unable to articulate the common in an antagonistic way. According to Dean, solidarity can be built and stabilized in time and space through growing vertical and diagonal structures. For the in the party is that structure, since it allows for collectivity to be collectively desired and collectively built. The, par the party embodies division, politicizing part of the supposed totality. The party reflects on the impossibility of the realization of the desire for collectivity. The party's role is to keep this desire alive and to invent new institutional forms that can mediate it. Dean's insistence on this type of party creates a danger of becoming dependent on the figure of the revolutionary and from the next personalization of the political. And still, this critique should not be interpreted as a return to, to, to totalitarian cause for harmony and a rejection of pluralism. We should instead try to rethink the idea of a party in terms of it growing out of concrete mobilizations and not perceive it <coughs> as an ideal fiction that we try to impose. A theoretical practice may spring out of concrete struggles, thus integrating various contradictions in the attempts to create collectivity out of conflictual groups and stances. Thank you, Madeleine. Perfect timing. And so we have um, now the question is, are we, um, Marco, uh, are we going to postpone everything 15 minutes because of the delay? Uh, ten, <coughs> ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> so then we have 20 minutes of, of um, for uh, debates. And don't forget that um, we promised also to include the possibility to continue the discussions. Uh, from the earlier panel. So who wants to go first? Thank you, this also had a question. A comment. It's more like a comment. Uh, uh, I was thinking of both the discussion we had uh, in the afternoon, uh, all the open questions about uh, left-wing uh, organization <coughs> building in, uh, in, former, in the former uh, Yugoslavia, and then these examples from Romania and Bulgaria that at least show that uh, social antagonism can still have results, can, seem, can still affect the political scene, can still shift the balance of forces even indirectly. Um, I, I think that there are a couple of... Uh, and I was also thinking about the experience of the Greek uh, revolutionary left in the 1980s, which was practically in shambles. <laughs> of course, you know, the Communist Party and other parties were strong, but I'm talking about the, the anti what we now tend to call the anti-capitalist left, which was really small groups. I mean, in, in the dimensions discussed uh, about crazy. I mean, if you had 50 members in, in the 1980s, you were a group. 
took a start thinking that you would be a party or something like that. So, and I was thinking that uh, what gave us power back then was uh, trying to find roots in movement. And I think this is a good n number one uh, task. If there are movements, then there can still be a left. Uh, and, uh, and movements arise. People have difficulties, people have grievances, people uh, want collective rights to, to defend, and there are still collective rights, they're not being uh, abolished administratively. So that's, that's the first thing. You need movements, you need to have a base. You cannot have left wing politics simply as uh, advocacy of, uh, of causes. You have to represent something. And also, if you start by that, this can also, uh, and, and the second point I was thinking is that, uh, I think the same goes for Greece also, you need uh, a new version of, 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 of front policies. Uh, that is, uh, party building, let's play with words, today, today means front building. You cannot have uh, a traditional mode of an organization, of a group turning into an organization, turning into uh, a party. You need to bring together different experiences, uh, strategies, and sensitivities around perhaps basic, you know, uh, common aims, and without stop, without any to debate. And I think this is the only way. For example, uh, go back again to the experience of Greece in the 1980s and early 1990s. The fact that we had uh, both in the student union, student movement, and the and the trade union movement. A, a, a tradition of collaboration between different you know, revolutionary groups in common, let's say, unitary forms of participation helped to help create uh, a material basis for a common understanding for cooperation, a culture of uh, comradeship, uh, as opposed, for example, the, the Greek revolutionary left of the 1970s, when whatever group was more closely to you ideologically was also the biggest <laughs> enemy, that's for example the story of Greek Maoism, <laughs> and some sentences of Greek philosophy. Uh, so I think these are, these are common, these are common experiences, and I think that it's also interesting that uh, since the, the end of the 2000s, it seems that the, there is a new protest cycle in, in various forms all over the world and also all over the region which is also something positive, and, and this means that uh, despite the weight of actually existing neoliberalism in, in, in the region, uh, new generations can more easily think of the grievances in terms of collective struggle, and practically this is, you know, the uh, aqua viva, the water of life for, <laughs> for the left, traditionally, historically, and the only way to reinvent itself. Thank you. I got this for the comment. Maybe, okay, Marco. Okay, I have obvious question for Madeleine, the trade union uh, uh, stuff. But from the perspective that the, the, your last point was this kind of criticism of Jody Dean's poetics of the parties, so call it that way, and your insistence that it should start from some kind of concrete struggle. So can you expand that criticism by showing examples of these trade unions? Uh, action and how can this new left uh, somehow cooperate or coordinate their actions with the trade unions, if, if there is any kind of possibility yeah. or opportunity in that, in that direction? Well, we actually, all the presentations today gave me food for, that, uh, food for thought on that question because we actually, when we were working on this campaign against um, the privatization of water and sanitation services, we tried to contact some um, Bulgarian unions, for example, the unions of the uh, medical uh, workers, that is part of uh, EPSU. And um, actually, we contacted some representatives, but they said that they co uh, co could not be involved in um, a public uh, campaign against a uh, uh, um, company that um, uh, has the concession of the water services because these, uh, they have this ethical principle not to oppose the employers. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> yeah, so we we were thinking, um, we didn't really know how to react to that <laughs> yeah. coming from the from a syndicate. So um, today, like um, 
yeah, maybe we should contact uh, the workers themselves, the workers that work in these uh, companies. I don't know. In a way, we have to um, deal with that after some research, I guess, in archives and so on. But uh, um, still, like uh, through the representatives of the syndicates, uh, it is impossible to um, do anything against the uh, uh, private companies. Do you want to add uh, to comment on the Panag on Panagiotis's comment? Or? Well, I agree. <laughs> so, um, thank you uh, both uh, Ovidio and uh, Madeleine. We'll now have uh, Marco, how long? 15 minutes oh, break. break. And then we continue with our uh, last uh, keynote lecture, Panagiotis Sotiris, on the uh, situation in Greece. See you all here in 15 minutes.